will hold the satellite in a fixed orbit. In that position, WMAP shielding can block out the contaminating microwave radiation from the sun and the earth. But getting there takes one of the most complex trajectories ever planned for a space science mission. One of the headquarters officials was uh, visiting me one day and asked me, what, what part are you most worried about? And I said, getting from here to there. WMAP's guidance systems perform flawlessly. But once it reaches L2, the satellite still needs a full year to produce its first results. That year gives Tony just the time he needs. Before NASA's WMAP can report back, Tony manages to gather enough data to yield a major discovery. One tends to forget, because of all the, the difficulties that one has to go through, uh, just the, the true wonder of what we are seeing. What we're seeing are fine details, more than 100 times smaller than those Kobe saw. The first direct observational link between the early universe and the one we live in. These brighter spots, hotter in temperature, are showing where there's more stuff. And that's extremely exciting because it's actually showing where all the structure in the universe that we see around us today came from. Over billions of years, gravity will transform this slightly denser clump of stuff into this, a cluster of galaxies home to trillions of stars like our own sun. Had there not been seeds like this in the microwave background showing that there was more stuff, we wouldn't be here today talking about it. This is a wonderful time in science. This is actually the best time in science because we have the satisfaction of, through these observations and these discoveries, having confirmed certain predictions. We are actually on the brink of a revolution of unimaginable proportions. In February 2003, that revolution takes off. In just over a year, WMAP has sampled more than two million points in the sky. Finally, almost four decades after the faint glow of the Big Bang was first detected, the satellite delivers a beautifully detailed picture of the peaks and valleys that mark where the matter lies in our newborn universe. So David, this is it, huh? Well, this is the map. This is what the universe looked like 380,000 years after the Were you the first one to see this when it came from the telescope? I think I was the first one to see this particular version of the map. What did it feel like? Oh, it was so cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, to know that you're one of the few people who get to see this first was just awesome. In this version of the WMAP picture, the peaks are hot spots that show where the superclusters of galaxies will form. The valleys will become empty space. Most important, this pattern is so detailed that cosmologists can now piece together almost the entire story of what happened during the birth of the universe to create the structures we see today. The Big Bang itself remains shrouded in mystery. Although WMAP tells us that the universe's birthday came 13.7 billion years ago. Using WMAP data, we can reach back almost to that beginning, at a time when the universe was tiny, much smaller than this pearl. We're not sure what came next, but our best current idea is that an event called inflation triggered a hyperfast expansion, enlarging the universe a trillion, trillion, trillion fold. But just as suddenly as it began, inflation stops, leaving behind a dense, hot, violent universe. All of space is filled with a zoo of exotic particles, the precursors of ordinary matter. And all the light within the cosmos is trapped in an endless pinball game bouncing off these particles. But as the universe continues to expand, it cools, until at last, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, temperatures fall 
to the point at which familiar, stable atoms can form. In that instant, the primordial fog clears and the light from the Big Bang flashes free. Forming the image that WMAP has captured, a true baby picture of the cosmos. The really remarkable thing that MAP found was the universe was incredibly simple. I think we're now close to the right story for how the universe evolved from a second or so after the Big Bang till today. But not so fast. There are no signs of life in this picture. The WMAP universe contains only the simplest atoms, mostly hydrogen, just a single proton with one electron, along with a little bit of helium. Living chemistry requires more complex building blocks, carbon, oxygen, iron, and the rest. But if they didn't exist in the early universe, where did they come from? Recent supercomputing simulations show the infant universe filled with vast, billowing clouds of hydrogen. Almost immediately, the clouds begin to condense, pulled together by their own gravity. As hydrogen piles on, the central region grows more and more dense, until something brand new lights up the universe, a star. These first stars are hydrogen giants, 100 times or more larger than our own sun. Such massive stars are short-lived, two or three million years at the most, and they go out with a bang. An explosion so big, they've been dubbed hypernovae. And it's with these cataclysms that the universe begins to accumulate the building blocks of life. All the atoms in the universe heavier than hydrogen and helium are forged by stars. Stars are really interesting. They, they don't just sit there. They know, uh, they, because they last so much longer than we do, we think they're, they're permanent. Stars are the ultimate alchemists. They, they turn light elements into heavier ones. They get the energy that they need to glow that way. The star begins its life made out of hydrogen and helium mostly, about 70% hydrogen, 28% helium in the case of the sun. In a star's core, the temperature and pressure are so high that hydrogen atoms fuse together to make helium. Hydrogen fusion releases prodigious amounts of energy, the heat and light of a star. That's the story for 90% of the life of a star, fusing hydrogen uh, to make helium. Eventually, though, the star runs out of hydrogen and begins to fuse its stocks of helium, making yet heavier elements. And so the way it works, and it always works this way, is that it contracts and it gets hotter. And if it can find something new to burn, whether it's the kitchen sink or coal or whatever, it'll burn it. Helium is taken three at a time to make carbon. You can add one more helium to that carbon and make element number eight, oxygen. That's a tremendous step forward. You get carbon and nitrogen and oxygen uh, made in stars. Now this is great because on the board we already have the principal elements of life. Organic chemistry is the chemistry uh, of carbon. Carbon fuses next, 